Hello, Super Saver. I hope you're healthy and well this week. So at the time of this taping, these are the seven-day yields for the top three money market funds that our community seems most interested in. Fidelity SPACs, Schwab's SWVXX, and Vanguard's VMFXX. More on what the seven-day yield actually means shortly. And here's the top annualized rate that I could find from a high-yield savings account with a zero minimum balance requirement. And that's what I'll be talking about in today's video. Money market funds. Are they really like cash in a high yield savings account? What's better and or safer? And specifically, these are the five questions I'll be answering. Which type of money market fund might be best for you at Fidelity, Schwab, and Vanguard? What the seven day yield on money market funds actually means. How money market funds are structured to protect your money. Can you lose money in a money market fund? And what other options might you have? And what we're doing right now. Money market funds are a type of mutual fund that invests in highly liquid short-term instruments. The weighted average maturity of money market funds is typically less than 60 days. And generally, they're viewed as a low-risk, low-return place for investors to park their money in a brokerage account while waiting for the right investment opportunity to come along. That is, until recently, when interest rate hikes as well as concerns around bank collapses drove super savers in troves the safety of money market funds even for longer-term investing. According to the Investment Company Institute, ICI, which reports money market fund assets to the Federal Reserve each week, total money market assets increased by $117.41 billion to $5.13 trillion for the week ended Wednesday, March 22nd. This number stood at just about $4.62 trillion a few short months ago in November of 2022. So money market funds, they generally fall into three different categories. Government money market funds, prime money market funds, and municipal money market funds. Government money market funds like Fidelity SPACs and Schwab's SNVXX, I've included the seven-day yield at the time of this taping for each fund. Please note that yields are subject to change, so be sure to check your broker's website for the latest rates. So government money market funds typically invest in short-term government securities, such as U.S. Treasuries and repurchase agreements, that are collateralized fully with government securities. Think of repurchase agreements, also known as repos, as short-term, collateral-backed, interest-bearing loans. Government money market funds may also invest in the debt of government-sponsored enterprises, GSEs, such as Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the federal home loan banks. GSE debt carries the implicit banking of the U.S. government, but is not explicitly guaranteed by the full faith and credit of our government. Only U.S. Treasury securities are. And if you want that extra safety from investing only in paper that is backed directly by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, there are quite a few Treasury money market funds out there as well. Treasury money market funds are considered a subset of government money market funds. Government money market funds are basically as safe as it gets when it comes to the three different types of money market funds and may be a good option for you if you're someone whose first priority is safety amongst all else over return, for example. Prime money market funds like Fidelity's SPRXX and Schwab's SWVXX invest primarily in high-quality, short-term securities of U.S. and non-U.S. issuers such as certificates of deposits, commercial paper, repos, and bankers' acceptances of non-U.S. Treasury assets. A banker's acceptance is like a post-dated check, a promised future payment issued and guaranteed by a bank. These U.S. and non-U.S. issuers may include corporations, U.S. government agencies, and GSEs. Relative to government money market funds, Prime money market funds are generally considered a bit riskier because they hold non-treasury and non-government assets. But on a return basis, they've also historically offered higher yields than government money market funds. As such, they may be a good option for you 
if you're someone who's willing to take on a little bit more risk for a little bit more return. And keep in mind that when I speak of risk, my reference point is government money market funds, not other types of investments. In a wider context, even prime money market funds are generally considered safe investments. Municipal money market funds like Vanguard's VCTXX for California and VYFXX for New York usually invest in short-term municipal securities, which are issued by state and local governments. The interest earned from municipal money market funds is exempt from federal income tax and, in some cases, even from state income tax if you reside in that state. If you lived in California, for example, and you bought shares of Vanguard's California-focused VCTXX, you wouldn't have to pay federal or state taxes on the interest earned from VCTXX. Relative to government money market funds, municipal money market funds like prime money market funds are generally considered a bit riskier because they hold non-treasury assets, but they may be a good choice for you if you're someone who doesn't mind the additional risk in exchange for the federal and possibly state tax exemptions on interest earned. Municipal money market funds also tend to make the most sense if you're someone that's in a higher tax bracket and, of course, when held in a taxable investment account, so not a Roth IRA, for example. It's also important to keep in mind that because of their tax advantages, the yield that you'll typically see on municipal money market funds will be lower than those on government money market funds and prime money market funds. There is an additional noteworthy item to keep in mind about government, prime, and municipal money market funds. And it's that money market funds, regardless of the type, can sometimes be split into two classes, one class for retail investors and another class for institutional investors. Retail money market funds are for folks like you and me and typically have low or even no minimum investment requirement. Institutional money market funds are usually targeting corporations, pension funds, and other large organizations and have a higher minimum investment requirement. There are also some other fairly important differences between retail and institutional money market funds, but we'll cover this in greater detail when we talk about whether you can lose money in a money market fund. Because first, I'd like to address the question of what the seven-day yield often quoted for money market funds actually means, because there's quite a bit of confusion around this. The seven-day yield, sometimes also referred to as the seven-day SEC yield on a money market fund, is the average income return over the previous seven days, annualized, assuming the rate stays the same for one year. It is typically calculated as the total income of a money market fund minus any expenses divided by the total number of outstanding shares. You will often see two seven-day yields, for example, with SNVXX here. On the most fundamental level, this one here basically assumes reinvestment of fund dividends, and this lower seven-day yield here assumes no reinvestment of fund dividends. The important thing to remember is, as I mentioned earlier, that the seven-day yield is an annualized number, meaning that is not what you would earn in seven days on your investment in SNVXX. The Securities and Exchange Commission requires funds to calculate and disclose their seven-day SEC yield as part of their regulatory filings and in their marketing materials. This allows investors to have a standardized way of comparing the yield on different funds. Do keep in mind that the seven-day yield measures past performance and is not a guarantee of future performance. And it usually does change over time as the fund's income, expenses, and assets change. So now that you know what the seven-day yield on money market funds actually means and is designed to illustrate, let's move on to how money market funds like Fidelity SPACs, Schwab's SNVXX and SWVXX, and Vanguard's VMFXX are structured to protect your money. So, 
I'm going to use Fidelity's Government Money Market Fund SPACs as the example in this section on how money market funds are structured to protect your money. Because at the time of this taping, SPACs is the largest in terms of asset size at about $245 billion relative to Schwab's SWVXX and Vanguard's VMFXX. But know that the same general principle and structure that I'm about to explain using SPACs also applies to SWVXX and VMFXX, or frankly, all other proper money market funds. So when you as a Fidelity customer buy $1 worth of SPACs, your dollar goes into the SPACs money market fund. And in return, you get one share of SPACs. This SPACs money market fund is its own entity. It's set up as a separate investment company. SPACs is subject to regulatory oversight by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, with its own fund managers who manage the SPACs portfolio and who make the buy and sell decisions for SPACs. Your dollar and the buy and sell decisions from these SPACs money managers are sent to the custodian, which in the case of SPACs is the Bank of New York Mellon, BNY Mellon or Boney for short, and held in a trust capacity. The custodian Boney holds your $1 and money from other SPACs investors and uses that money to carry out the buy and sell orders that it receives from the SPACs fund managers. All SPAC securities and remaining cash, if any, are held by the custodian in trust. In addition to holding a money market fund's assets for safekeeping, the custodian may also provide the money market fund with record keeping, legal, compliance, tax, and other services. This setup means that in the event that Fidelity fails, SPACs as a separate investment company should still be standing. And all SPAC securities and cash, all SPAC's assets, should still be sitting at Boney in the trust account for SPACs. Essentially, you wouldn't have lost a dollar. And if, for whatever reason, Fidelity fails and your one share of SPACs is missing, that's when you'd file a claim with the SIPC so that they can replace your missing share of SPACs. Because money market mutual fund shares held in a customer's account at an SIPC member brokerage firm qualify as securities under the Securities Investor Protection Act, SIPA, and therefore are subject to the $500,000 limit of protection, not the $250,000 limit applicable to cash. It's important to remember that although investors treat money market funds like cash, they are securities and as such may lose value. In a liquidation proceeding under SIPA, subject to the limits of SIPC protection, SIPC will return money market fund shares to a customer, but will not protect the customer against any decline in the value of shares. Right, now that we've covered how money market funds are structured to protect your money, let's talk about this part here, about how money market funds may lose value. Money market funds are usually priced at a dollar per share, as we showed in this earlier illustration. You pay a dollar for a dollar share of SPACs. This dollar is referred to as the net asset value, or NAV for short. Money market funds try to maintain this NAV of a dollar, usually by distributing interest earned on portfolio holdings to investors in the form of dividends. Remember when I showed you this table earlier on the differences between retail money market funds and institutional market funds? Well, there's one other major difference, and that has to do with the NAV of a dollar. It makes sense that the NAV should fluctuate a bit, sometimes above a dollar and sometimes below a dollar, depending on whether the value of the assets held in a money market fund increases or decreases with the markets, respectively. Because as many of us who own T-bills, longer-term treasuries, brokered CDs, index funds know, these values usually do change on a daily basis, and depending on the security, sometimes even more often. Well, retail money market funds, and government ones as well, are legally allowed to use special pricing and valuation mechanisms to keep their NAV stable at exactly a dollar. If a money market fund's NAV deviates by more than half a cent from a dollar, 
the fund would have to reprice its shares to something other than $1. This is known in the industry as breaking the buck. But of course, the most important risk with your money market fund is that some of the investments the fund made will go sour, leading to a loss in the fund's assets and NAV. This was what happened in 2008 when the investors panic redeemed shares in the reserve primary fund following Lehman Brothers collapse. The fund held millions of dollars of Lehman debt and eventually had to liquidate after its NAV fell to 97 cents from the mass redemptions, resulting in chaos amongst numerous money market funds, understandably. To put it simply, breaking the buck for whatever reason, be it actual losses in the underlying assets or just short-term pricing fluctuations, is bad, really bad. And that's why retail money market funds and government ones as well are legally allowed to use special pricing and valuation mechanisms to keep their NAV stable at exactly a dollar for as long as possible. That's also why you'll very often see a risk disclaimer similar to this one for SPACs at the bottom of most retail money market mutual fund documentation. You could lose money by investing in the fund. Although the fund seeks to preserve the value of your investment at a dollar per share, it cannot guarantee it will do so. Institutional prime and municipal money market funds, on the other hand, must allow their NAV to float, to move up or down based on the market price of their holdings. If the value of these fund shares decrease, investors in these funds will likely lose money. That said, the fluctuations observed for money market funds should be much smaller than for longer dated securities, and most investment managers try to keep institutional money market funds as close as possible to the dollar per share as well. The other important thing to note is this. To avoid a run on a money market fund, when many or possibly even every investor wants their money back at once, while the fund has its money invested and doesn't have enough short-term liquidity at hand. Basically, to help prevent what happened in 2008 when the reserve primary fund broke the buck following the Lehman collapse, money market funds have two levers that they can use to manage their assets and outflows in times of market stress. The first is temporary liquidity fees and redemption gates. A liquidity fee is when an investor has to pay a fee upon share redemption. And a redemption gate is when redemptions are temporarily suspended altogether. The goal in these instances is to stabilize the fund's assets and outflows. But what it means for you is that your money market fund investment could be less liquid in times of market stress than you originally thought it would be. All money market funds, except government money market funds, are allowed to use liquidity fees and redemption gates when and if necessary. And in some cases, they may be even required to do this. Government money market funds can choose to use these levers at their discretion if this is properly disclosed in their fund prospectus. In fact, going back to the SPACs risk disclaimer from earlier, we can see that SPACs as a government money market fund explicitly states that they will not use liquidity fees and redemption gates. The fund will not impose a fee upon the sale of your shares, nor temporarily suspend your ability to sell shares if the fund's weekly liquid assets fall below 30% of its total assets because of market conditions or other factors. And then it goes on to list further risks. The second lever, permanent suspension of redemptions, is another way that money market funds can use to manage their assets and outflows in times of stress. Under certain, and in my mind, I would think extreme conditions, money market funds are allowed but not required to permanently suspend redemptions and close out the fund so that an orderly liquidation can occur. Having said all this, money market funds under normal circumstances when there's no market stress are still relatively low risk when compared to other mutual funds and other investments, hence the historically lower return. 
Nonetheless, it's important to understand that as low risk as they may be, money market funds are not cash. And in some fairly extreme circumstances, they may lose value or become less liquid than what most investors perceive. Which brings me to what other options you may have. So, if you're genuinely concerned about your money market fund shares breaking the buck or about the liquidity issues that may arise in times of market stress, or if you decide for any other reason that money market funds are just not for you, one truly safe option for you may simply be real hard cash sitting in a high yield savings account at an FDIC member bank. As I showed at the beginning of this video, the rates aren't so vastly different depending on which bank you go to and may be worth the peace of mind. And as customary, if you know of any better rates, drop a comment below and let me and the other super savers know. Of course, real hard cash in a high yield savings account may not always be an option if you're holding significantly more than the FDIC threshold of $250,000 and don't want to open additional bank accounts or if you have cash parked in your brokerage account waiting for the next right investment opportunity to come along. In this case, another possibility may be to simply opt for going with the least risky of the money market funds, the government money market funds, which for Fidelity is SPACs, for Schwab, there's SNVXX, SNOXX, and SNSXX. For the Schwab government and treasury money market funds I just mentioned, the minimum initial investment is $0. If you have a million dollars or more, which is great, you could earn a few more basis points with these other government money market options here. And if you're with Vanguard, VMRXX, VMFXX, and VUSXX are the three government and treasury money market funds you can choose from. Do note that the initial investment requirement is $3,000. Because the flight to safety concept that we talked about in these earlier videos, all linked below, apply similarly to money market funds. As a reminder, flight to safety refers to the phenomenon in which investors move out of risky assets during times of market uncertainty, like now, into the safety of U.S. Treasuries backed by the full faith and credit of our government. As you can see from this money market fund asset table that I showed you towards the beginning of the video, since the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and subsequent turmoil in the markets, both retail and institutional investors have trended out of prime money market funds as well as tax-exempt municipal money market funds and into government money market funds because of the perceived relative safety of government money market funds over prime and municipal money market funds. So as for us, we're still keeping two to three months of emergency savings in our FDIC insured bank and we're laddering into 13-week T-bills. And when we park our money in our Fidelity accounts, waiting for the next investment opportunity, it does usually go into SPACs. At this point in time, with the data I have, I remain not too concerned about a US default and also not too concerned about SPACs breaking the buck. And as I've already shown you, SPAC states in their risk disclaimer that they will implement neither liquidity fees nor redemption gates. But as I always say, everyone's financial journey is different and past performance is no guarantee of future outcomes. So do tell me if you're so inclined what you're doing with your money after everything you've learned about money market funds today. Money market funds yay or money market funds nay. All right, super saver. If you're thinking, gosh, Jen, I have no idea what I'm doing with my money, information overload, then check out this recent video here on our top five money to do's before the next bank meltdown. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to share it with those you care about. And of course, hit that thumbs up and see you again very soon with another brand new wealth building video.